I am a huge fan of, um, of hooks because you don't have to open something. So, you know, my first foray into meeting people where they were was when we first got married and my husband would leave a cer- certain clothing items in a pile on the floor, the same place every day. And I just put a hook on the wall right next to it. It's a ra- It was a random location. It didn't seem like a place where a clothing item should be hung. But I thought, this is where it ends up every day. I'm going to meet him where he is and put a hook right there. <laughs> and lo and behold, he could, he could put on a hook. <laughs> Hi, this is Danae. I'm the founder of Simple Families. Simple Families is an online community for parents who are seeking a simpler, more intentional life. In this show, we focus on minimalism with kids, positive parenting, family wellness, and decreasing the mental load. My perspectives are based in my firsthand experience raising kids, but also rooted in my PhD in child development. So you're going to hear conversations that are based in research, but more importantly, real life. Thanks for joining us. Hi there, and thank you for tuning in. Today, I have a journey to simplicity for you. A few times a year, I chat with a member of the Simple Families community, and you all share a little bit more about what the journey to living lighter has looked like. Today, I have Meredith's voice. That's who you heard in the intro. Meredith is sharing about her journey to simplicity and admits that she is still on the journey like the rest of us. And she gives a window into what realistic minimalism looks like in her home. It's not perfect. And raising kids with their own thoughts and opinions about the stuff absolutely comes into play. Shortly after becoming a mother, Meredith became very interested in the zero waste movement, which is as the name implies, an effort to waste zero and have no garbage. I think I most enjoyed hearing that part of the journey because as most things in motherhood, we start off by idealizing the process and then slowly unpacking and finding a balance that works for us. And for Meredith, that looks like buying less, buying better, and buying more intentionally. I especially love the tips that she has for buying clothing secondhand, which has always been a struggle for me. And I know I'm not alone in this, especially with the availability of cheap, cute clothing, in particular for kids. The fact that they grow out of things quickly often leads us to buy more disposable clothing. I always thought that buying secondhand was a lot harder and a lot more time consuming. But Meredith has showed me that it's not. And if we can just shift our mindsets to that possibility, we can make it happen. I hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, Meredith. How are you? I'm great. How are you, Danae? I am good. It's good talking with you today. Yeah, I am really excited. I have so much to share and I am really excited for this conversation. Yes. Well, start by telling us who's in your family, who lives in your house. Yeah. So I live um, in a small house um, with my husband and our two children who are seven and five. Okay. And you are employed outside the home? I am currently working from home, just like a lot of people still. And actually my husband is working from home as well, which is uh, tricky since we did not expect that when we purchased this house many years ago. Uh, does not have an office space. So we've had to figure that out. Um, But I work for a nonprofit and my husband works for the local university. Ah, okay. And you're in Vermont. We are. We're in Vermont in the Burlington area. Were you born and raised in Vermont? I was born in Southern Vermont and uh, raised there. It's very rural, very beautiful. And um, I also spent quite a bit of time with my father in Manhattan, which is where he worked. He commuted um, to Southern Vermont from Manhattan, which is actually not that uncommon, um, shockingly. Um, and so I had quite the A to Z upbringing in, uh, the Upper West Side of Manhattan and rural Vermont. And I am currently living in the most dense urban area in Vermont. So I tried to find the exact happy medium. (laughs) Right. So have you ever thought about living in a bigger city like New York with your kids? Absolutely. We um, are definitely our temperaments and our lifestyles well suited to having um, to being in a city. I think um, where we live now, like I said, is the most dense urban area. It's 
um, a city called Winooski in Vermont. Um, and we are in 950 square feet with the four of us. Um, and that's ample room. I mean, our setup is a little awkward because this house was built a um, hundred years ago. I think with a little bit more of an efficient layout, um, we would be happy. We'd be happy to be in an apartment in a condo um, because we do definitely see our location um, as an extension of our house. You know, we yeah. even during the pandemic, we um, certainly didn't spend all of our time within our four walls. Yeah. Now, when you say that your temperaments are inclined to be more in a city, maybe more fast paced, do you think that people like you and like me, I'm like this too, mm -hmm. do you think that we're better off somewhere quieter for kind of like a forced solitude? What do you think? That's a really good question. I think um, now that I'm in my mid thirties, I'm finally realizing the benefits of that. Um, but it does make me uneasy. <laughs> um, I think even where we live um, in Vermont, we can get to very uh, quiet nature quite quickly. And I'd still rather be there with my loud family, you know, <laughs> taking over. I mean, and I think that's the reality that, um, you know, I've never been a parent in the country. Um, and I think ultimately it wouldn't be as quiet as I remember it as a kid, maybe. Um, I think... I think, you know, people's temperaments do change at, over time. I, I don't see our, us moving to the country ever. Um, we would only ever get more urban, I think. Um, but I also think there is a misconception to an urban environment to being um, very loud and very um, overstimulating. I think there is so much anonymity and solitude to be had in a larger city or area. Um and that I think you almost can't find that in the city. I mean, where I grew up, I would know every single person in the grocery store, for example. So to me, you know, I would rather live in a larger area where I maybe I see people I know. And that's so fun when I'm on a walk with my kids and we see our neighbors and our friends. But it's also nice to just be able to have your own little life, um, you know, carved out. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. So were your kids born and raised in this town that you're in now? Yes. Yep. So when did you start learning about and thinking about simplicity? I think that I've always been really drawn to um, having a tidy space, but I never had the, the right tools. And so that tidiness was what originally introduced me to sort of the decluttering aspect. I was um, typically not very messy, I would say, but I just had overflowing stuff. And I was like every child and every, you know, teenager and college student where you just have so much stuff. And there's, um, you know, you, you buy a new outfit for going out or whatever, which was just ridiculous thinking back, but that's just how we were. Um, and Can't be seen in the same thing more than once a month type of attitude. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And there was just that idea of, abundance was better and uh, more is more. And so as a kid, obviously you have those inclinations towards collection, which I definitely had. Um, and I think there's a really funny um, story that I tell, which when I tell people who know me now, who have met me in the last, you know, five, six, seven years, where I've very much been deep into minimalism as a lifestyle, they're shocked to hear this. But when I went to college, I went with more than 20 purses. Wow. <laughs> why? <laughs> you know, what did I think? What but did I why imagine? not? I mean. <laughs> right. But I really thought this is a very good use of the limited space that I have yeah. to move out there. I moved from Vermont to Wisconsin. I went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And it was wild to me to think that that felt really necessary. It felt like this is this is a representation of me. My stuff was very important. Um, and I would say that, you know, it took like a lot of people moving across the country a couple of times, um, being forced to contend with looking at a, at a truck full of my stuff that I packed myself because we didn't have money for movers. I mean, I'm lifting every piece of furniture and I'm lifting every item and it didn't happen the first time it happened. Maybe the third time I moved long distances that we, I finally realized what is the real value of this and what is it that I want to live like 
and how do I envision my day to day? And very easily, my husband and I were able to get rid of 50% of our things. And then it just became easier from there. Once you see a sliver of benefit, I mean, there's always that just do one drawer. Yeah. Rip the Band-Aid off. Yeah, rip the Band-Aid. <laughs> just do one thing and you'll immediately see the benefits. I think um, having air and space was shockingly delightful. And I never had that. I mean, I was organized, but every square inch had something in it. Every right. square inch had a labeled box or, a, you know, so organization does not mean that I was actually functional in my yeah. space. Were you good about keeping your things organized? Well, truthfully, it became almost a personality trait or a hobby taking care of my things. It's a lot of work to take care of your things and to put everything away. If you have 20 purses, very quickly it can get out of control in a dorm room. So I was organized, but because I had to be. Um, and because I didn't like the mess. Um, so I was really measured, but it was, it was a hobby now looking back. I mean, it was a time commitment to manage my things and I spent a lot of time managing them. Yeah. And I think in motherhood that often we feel like we still have that hobby and it's not one that we want anymore. Absolutely. And I'm so grateful that I came to this, um, lifestyle or this way of thinking or this way of reacting to my environment before I became a parent. It definitely, I dug in even further when I became a parent. Um, but it, I was able to start off with a foundation of being super confident in my choices to have less stuff. Um, yeah. I was told by strangers on the internet, friends, family, uh, everyone in between that like, oh, that's a really nice little thing that you're trying that little, like, you know, uh, experiment. Um, but there's no way you can keep it up with the child. So, um, I, I was that determined <laughs> to keep it up and turns out just like that first breath of fresh air that I got that first, oh, this is what I really went. When I want an organized space, what I wanted was less stuff to manage. So um, you it, didn't want to spend all your time organizing. You just no. wanted it to feel light. I did. I wanted it to feel functional and feel and, and honestly, I think there's, I'm not going to go, I'm not going to go, um, you know, be embarrassed by saying it's delightful to me. Like I get joy out of opening a drawer that's not overstuffed. I get joy out of, you know, seeing my kids play with things that have been brought out and they're so like delighted by this very small range of things. Um, yeah. And so I think that, that, you know, piece of it it's easy to, to want to keep it up because it gives you pleasure. You know, I'm not, I'm yeah. not struggling. I mean, certainly we have let the pendulum swing back and forth a few times. Um, the pandemic certainly um, shifted things a bit. Um, but ultimately I always go back to paring down and stripping away, not because I'm punishing myself, not because I'm saying, Oh, I can't, this doesn't, this means I'm not a true minimalist or whatever it is. It's just, I'm happier when I have fewer options or when I have fewer things to manage. What about your partner? Is he naturally tidy and prone towards tidiness? Not at all. Okay. Um, and to the point where we are both definitely, we like shopping. We like, um, we like things. We like beautiful things. We enjoy interior design. We enjoy fashion and, um, he had really no interest in it, but was very supportive. And certainly like anyone will say, you start with your own things. You don't address your, your partner or your roommate's things. You don't address your shared items first. Um, and that's what I did. I sort of showed him like, look what I did. And it was very easy for him to be like, I'm going to try this too. And again, for, for him, it was maybe a little bit of a, of an experiment, a little bit of a game. Um, at first. And now he's very much in it, especially since we've had children and he's seen the massive benefit um, for them having capsule wardrobes for, you know, for them having fewer toys. Um, just the, the benefits outweigh the difficulty of that initial push. Yeah. And it's interesting when you were describing yourself and how you enjoy opening a drawer that's tidy. It made me think of my partner because that's mm -hmm. how he is. Like he yeah. likes to have like the drawer organizers with 
one spot per thing. Like yeah. the, the, the toothbrushes go here and the toothpaste yeah. goes here. And that is really, really hard for me. Yeah. I'm the kind of person that just, I feel like I spend more time putting the thing back into the right little container mm-hmm. than I would if I just threw it all in the same drawer and then just dug around and found what I wanted when I pulled it out. Right. And I would say to be very transparent, I'm probably somewhere in the middle. Okay. I I like the the I like the drawer being not overstuffed, but it doesn't need to be perfect because okay. especially since I share my I share my space um with my family we have a very small house. We all share everything. We don't have a playroom. We don't have an office. We are all in the same space. So ultimately, I know that I'm not the only one in charge. Yeah. So I do set up systems that reflect how my family behaves. And ultimately, I also would reach for the low-hanging fruit because on a great day, on a day where I've had great sleep and I'm feeling good, I'll do everything back to a T. But if you've had newborn babies, if you've had, you know, I've had some stressful situations come up with elder parents, those are the days where the system needs to still function, even when you're at your quote unquote worst, you know? And so for me, I think I'm somewhere in the middle where the drawer may not be perfectly organized, but the drawer is not overstuffed with random things either. Yeah. And I think that's important to recognize that you have to create a space that works for everybody and everybody's brains. Because, you know, for me, it is an accomplishment just to get the thing back into the drawer. (laughs) So to get the thing back into the drawer, into the right container in the drawer is an extra step. That's not easy for me. Like I've definitely gotten better about it as I've gotten older and I have less stuff, but it's not how I'm naturally wired. And it's not how my daughter's naturally wired. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I'm winning the parenting lottery when she gets things back into the drawer. (laughs) So if I'm thinking about designing a setup like in a bathroom for the four of us and we share one bathroom too, it has to be easy enough that everybody can maintain the system. If the system gets to be too complicated that one person's not going to be able to maintain it, you're just going to spend all your time frustrated. Or one person ends up doing all the work, which, yeah. you know, if you, if you're willing to recognize that you're doing that and that's an important, again, managing your, t- your, your space is worth your time, go for it. But if you are going to feel frustrated or somehow, um, overwhelmed or honestly resentful, like you just can't, you know, you can't set yourself up for failure like that. And, and I, yeah, I mean, I, I have been known, I am a huge fan of, um, of hooks because you don't have to open something. So, you know, I'll say like one of our first sort of um, my first foray into meeting people where they were was when we first got married and my husband would leave certain clothing items in a pile on the floor, the same place every day. And I just put a hook on the wall right next to it. It's a, it was a random location. It didn't seem like a place where a clothing item should be hung but I thought this is where it ends up every yep. day. I'm going to meet him where he is and put a hook right there. And lo and behold, he could, he could put it on a hook. <laughs> yes. And that, that's such a good point. So whenever I talk to someone about messy drop zones, you know, where mm-hmm. you walk in and all, you, drop, you drop all your stuff, I ask yep. them like, where is the drop zone? Is yeah. it where you walk in the house? And so often it's not. And there ends up, you know, the drop zone is like in the back of the house and all the kids enter in the beginning, in the front of the house. And I'm like, well, if this, if the place to drop the stuff is not accessible, if it's not where the stuff naturally drops, then it's going to be disorganized. So even if it's not the prettiest spot or the perfect spot, it's maybe the perfect spot for your people who drop their stuff there. And ultimately you can, if, if aesthetics and if that is important to you, you can force it a tiny bit. But you have to meet, yeah, you have to meet yourself and your people where they are because otherwise it is, you, it's your responsibility. Yeah. We're getting ready to finish. Our basement is half finished and we're going to finish the other half. And my husband really wants to put like a mud room or a drop zone in the basement to enter from the basement. And my kids take the bus to and from school. So they come in and out the front door five days yeah. a week. So that's, I'm kind of like, well, I, I see that. Like I would like a really beautiful Instagram worthy mudroom too. Like that would be super nice. And there's room for it in the basement, but it doesn't really make sense to put the shoes down there when we need the fr- shoes at the front door. Mm-hmm. So that like really thinking about the function over the aesthetics is really important too. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's hard. It's hard to make those concessions because, you know, I think the internet has only exasperated our 
wants. And um, because there's so many beautiful examples, like I, I love Instagram. I think there's so much hate about comparing yourself to others. And to me, it's just inspirational. And I just am, again, delighted by it. I'm like, oh, look at that mudroom. <laughs> like, that's amazing. Um, but I think if you're not confident in where you stand, it can be really difficult and it can be really mentally challenging um, to be, to let go of not having those things. And I think the reality is the people that have those Instagram worthy spaces, I'm one of them too. I take pictures of my space. And if you come into my house, it's, it's probably 90% there, but it's not a hundred percent there. It's, you know, it's, it's real life and things are crooked and things are, maybe there's a, a random shoe. Why is there always a random shoe? I don't know. <laughs> my kids only have one pair of shoes, um, but there's always a random shoe yeah. and, um, and that's okay. Cause that's real life. Yeah. So now that your kids are school age, what are, do you feel like they're developing tendencies to accumulate stuff of their own that are different from yours? Absolutely. And they have been for a while. I have one daughter who is my older daughter, who's very, very intense, to put it lightly, about acquiring things. She gets fixated on certain things. She'll see, you know, we we do limit um, advertising in our home um, for a lot of different reasons. Um, But, you know, she'll acquire, you know, some some thing that she wants, whether she saw it in a store or she saw it in a catalog um, or occasionally on television. Um, you know, you can't stop all the ads from coming in and those ads are excellent. Um, (laughs) and she'll fixate on it for a long time and it will become something that she's very, you know, will not let it go. Um, and you know, she also likes collecting things. So if you have one of something, why not have eight, (laughs) you know, whereas I'm like, you, you have that thing. Isn't that great? But I want this other one that's exactly the same, but maybe the color is different. Yeah. And um, and I have another daughter who doesn't really have that same inclination towards toys or books or other items, but definitely has it towards clothing um, and towards dress up and towards like, you know, she's only five years old, but sh- lip gloss and earrings and all of that. And so they both have their areas where they're very fixated. And basically what I do because I identify with that. I want all the things. I get served up Instagram ads all the time or ads everywhere. And I'm like, oh, I do need that dress. Wouldn't that dress make my life perfect if I had that dress? You would be so infinitely happier with that dress. (laughs) Literally put it in my cart and then I'm like, I don't need this dress. But I am, you know, in my mid thirties, I've been through a lot and I've been reading books like yours and by other, lots of other authors for years about the benefits of, you know, paring down and, and, and living more simply as a way to identify what really matters. So it is difficult for a five-year-old and a seven-year-old to, to see the light. Right. So I don't try. Um, they, they have noticed on occasion, um, when my husband and I have been tired or something has happened and we haven't necessarily tidied up in the same way that we normally do the downstairs and they'll come down and be like, like they're, they're used to their environment being presented in a way that's tidy and ready for them. And if they're, and if it isn't, they're like, this is uncomfortable. So I do try to give them those examples, but also I don't give them any judgment. I would observe what they're saying. Yeah. It's really, that's really cool. Or that's really fun. Or that's really beautiful and sort of identify and repeat what they're saying about this item. But I think the judgment doesn't need to be there. Like, why do you need that? You have so many things like, that is not going to teach them that valuing that to value their current items. It's just going to teach them to feel shame in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and so I would rather just be there as a, a partner, but I, I'm going to say no, <laughs> but they know that I am not judging them for that want. Um, yeah. Want as much as you, as you want, put a million things on your wish list, you know, build lists, circle things in a catalog, do whatever you want. Um, it may not come into our home, but it's fine to think about it. And when they're adults, they'll be free to do what they want. And I expect them to rebel against the mm-hmm. lifestyle that we've built. And and maybe they will go in the completely opposite direction for a minute and maybe they'll come back or maybe they won't. Um, but I think both of them, even at their young ages, value materials and value quality. The few times that we've had, you know, 
thing, toys break that maybe were cheap plastic toys that they got, you know, because it was on their wish list and we ended up getting it for them. They recognize like that, that costs money, that costs time, me waiting for this thing. And then it broke. Like we might try to fix it, but if it can't be fixed, they're really upset, you know, at that, not at me or not at themselves, but at the fact that this is disposable, considered disposable, but to them it was so precious. So I do think they recognize um, quality and materials, which is something that we've instilled in them. But I I mean, who knows what they're going to do in the future, but all I want them to know is that I'm there for them, but I'm not going to buy all the stuff they want. (laughs) Yeah. I feel the same. I am fully open to and expecting my kids to go in their own direction. And when they get their own amounts of money that they're able to actually get themselves to the store and buy those things. So it's going to be part of the process, just like it was for us. Exactly. And we're still, I mean, I'm still learning during the pandemic. I did go, I wouldn't say I went against my better judgment, but I really went in a different direction. And I thought, well, I need to prepare the space for both of them to be home, for me to be home, for my husband to be home. You know, we installed new shelving and got new materials for them. Like, why am I trying to set up a school for them? But I did. I, I put it into my brain that I need to control this. And we did acquire a lot more items in a short amount of time. And I almost didn't realize it was happening. And then I took a step back and was like, you know, six months to a year in being like this, I don't recognize this life or this, you know, they're not touching the stuff that I bought them that, that board game that I said, this will change everything and teach them literacy and math. And, you know, we've played it a few times, but like did acquiring six new board games change our pandemic life? No, going on hikes did, you know, being patient and present with each other did. Those are the things that actually mattered, not what I purchased in order to survive, which I don't judge myself. You know, I don't judge myself for falling into that because, you know, during times of duress, buying something is very easy. Yeah. Especially in the current day and age, it's very easy to click and buy whether or not you can afford it. It's still often easier than ever. We're going to pause for a two minute word from today's sponsor. The first sponsor today is HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. You can skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. My kids absolutely love HelloFresh because they can easily jump in and start cooking with me because there's pictures that illustrate each step along the way which makes cooking possible even for those of us who don't do it particularly well. You can pick your favorites from 50 different weekly options and also skip weeks when you need to. So go to hellofresh.com slash simple16 and use the code simple16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. Go to hellofresh.com slash simple16 and use the code simple16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. Our second sponsor for today is KiwiCo. Spring has sprung at our house and we have had a lot of rain and I have been thankful for KiwiCo. Sure, we like to play outside in all types of weather, but sometimes it's good to have some indoor activities too. KiwiCo delivers monthly science and art projects that spark a lifelong love of learning for kids of all ages. Just recently, we did an air hockey kit where we actually turned our dining room table into an air hockey table. Everything we needed to do it was right in the box. So much fun, so much science. We all have loved it. There's definitely something for kids of all ages. Step into spring and celebrate the season of discovery with a KiwiCo subscription. Get 30% off your first month plus free shipping on any crate line with the code SIMPLE at KiwiCo.com. That's 30% off your first month at kiwico.com, promo code SIMPLE. Thanks for supporting our sponsors. Back to my chat with Meredith. So when did you get interested in zero waste? And tell us what zero waste does for anyone that doesn't know. Yeah, for sure. So I got interested in zero waste when I had my first daughter. So I was um, home with a newborn I had taken some maternity leave. I worked um, for a public relations agency and I had taken some maternity leave and then I was planning to go back part-time. And I 
like a lot of people who are, are active, when you have a newborn, your world stops. Um, all of a sudden, your whole world is like the couch, the bathroom, like your world shrinks very quickly. And, um, and I was looking for, I had always had an inclination towards being more eco-friendly. I mean, my mom actually washed and reused her saran wrap. Like that is who I grew up with. Um, and growing up in Vermont, there's such a closeness to, to food production and to the earth, whether, you know, whether you're into it or not. Um, and there's also the, sort of reuse, you know, use what you have, fix it. You know, those skills were in, instilled in me at a young age. I know how to sew. I know how to fix things. Repair was really big in my house growing up. So I had those things, um, but I wasn't really implementing any of that too too much in my home. We had decided to use cloth diapers and we had already, you know, really committed to minimalism. And I think... Um, the first, and they're inextricably linked in some ways. Um, people mm-hmm. who tend to want less things, some Venn diagram of that of that community is also interested in it for eco friendly reasons. So I had kind of heard this phrase um, around, and then I read um, Zero Waste Home by Bea Johnson, and in my newborn state of being feeling so stuck in my home. Um, and she was born in November and so quickly it was winter in Vermont and I, and I wasn't able to like go out and meet friends at the playground kind of thing. I, I went very deep, very quickly into the zero waste world. And again, my lovely partner, um, was a little confused, but said, okay, fine, let's try it. And I made a commitment in 2015 to go, go zero waste. So I was following the principles laid out by Bea Johnson and other leaders in that sphere um, to try to completely reduce my um, personal trash output. Is the goal really zero? The goal is close to zero. And I can say that now looking back was absolutely ludicrous. Um, Okay. Thank you for saying that. Cause I feel like my shoulders like going up to my, my ears right now just thinking about the absoluteness of that and the energy. In yes. That, that. And also it's entirely on an individual home. You know, now we're several years away from that. Um, seven years out from that initial experiment that we undertook. Um, I can see how much trash an individual home produces is not the ultimate in environmentalism. Okay. That being said, in that time in my life where I felt like I didn't have a place to put my activism or my energy and my intellectual curiosity, um, this seemed like an excellent experiment. It was an experiment I could do in the four walls of my home in which I felt stuck in. <laughs> like I felt very mm. stuck. Um, we lived in an apartment at the time. This is before we moved into our current home. And I, yeah, I felt like. I can't do anything. I can't go, you know, advocate for something. I can't, you know, I, I, I was also working from home. I worked for an agency that wasn't in Vermont. And so I just felt like I have to do something. And we did, I took pictures of my trash in a jar every month and put it online. (laughs) And very quickly I stopped doing that because the zero waste community is filled with incredible people who are innovative and kind and and wonderful and it's also filled with people that are jerks um so we so i quickly found my my community that was like people that were were recognizing that i that this is not real like this is not actually zero waste um because there were people that would would scrutinize and zoom in on my trash jar. Wow. Like, what kind of jar are we talking about? Like a mason jar? Mm-hmm. Like a mason wow. jar. Like, I have a cup here of water. Like, yeah. double this, you know? Okay. I mean, absolutely insane. And they would say, how come you didn't reuse this? How come? And I was just flabbergasted. And so yeah. quickly I stopped sharing that intimate part. Um, but we kept with the experiment. We really did. Um, And what I will say is that I still, there are things that I have no interest in revisiting from that part of my life. I have no interest in 
driving to three different stores to get the most amount of bulk items I can to be perfect about my sourcing of things. Um, I have no interest in beating myself up about fails. Yes. Um, that was a huge part of it was I'm, I'm a new mom. I'm in this newborn phase and I'm adding this layer of setting myself up. It You're was, like reading my mind right here, all the was, things I'm it thinking. Was, I mean, listen, <laughs> I, it was, looking back, I have a lot of hindsight, obviously. Yeah. And it's, at the time, it felt like urgent that I do this. Mm-hmm. And I think that is like a new mom thing where you you lose so much of your previous identity that you're just grasping. And I'm the kind of person who has a lot of energy and enthusiasm. And I, I poured it into this experiment and it did not turn out the way I thought it would, but there are things that I will to this day, never go back on. We, we just, during the pandemic, we never had trash pickup. We still produce very little trash, but we also have completely let go. We don't live in a cave with a garden. We live in a city. We have, you know, full-time jobs, two children in school. I will do my best, but I will also buy, um, you know, broccoli and plastic. Yeah. And it's just how it's going to be. I would rather have broccoli than no broccoli and I'm going to buy it in plastic. And, um, but there are things where I realize I'll never go back on. There are things that I learned from that experiment that I'm so grateful for. And I think the the major takeaway for me was trying things. So like I used to, I was like, I'm going to make my own crackers, which sounds like Little House on the Prairie, <laughs> but turns out for me and for my, our dietary restrictions and lifestyle, it's very easy. So we mm. still make our own crackers. Do we buy crackers? Yes. But I still make my own crackers. Do we, you know, we have a lot of things where we still buy it in bulk um, and it's just more efficient and it's less expensive and it's just easier. Um, I go back to like uh, cloth diapering where I dug into cloth diapering for the eco-friendliness of it thinking, I don't care how hard it is. I'm going to stick with it. But for our lifestyle, and again, we had washer and dryer in our, in our apartment. So that's a big thing. But for our lifestyle, it turns out it was easier for us than going out. Oh gosh, we're out of diapers at 11 PM. I have to go to the store. It was not that hard. I mean, it was just really not that hard for us in in our lifestyle. Um, Our daughter was healthier. I mean, she never got diaper rash. Like there was so many things. The interesting thing that tripped me up with cloth diapers was it was pre-minimalism. I didn't find minimalism until my first was like nine months old, Yeah, but I got too many. So I had like 24 cloth diapers and then, so I wouldn't have to do laundry every day. And then I would go like three or four days without washing the diapers. And then the diapers were were bad, like pretty gross. And that's just like cardinal mistake of cloth diapering was having too many. (laughs) Yeah, honestly. And I think that is also part of the, like the beauty of the internet, which is that there was a lot, there wasn't a lot at a certain time of like information out there about cloth mm-hmm. tapering. And, um, I was really lucky that I, that I, yeah, aired on the side of too little. We, um, didn't want it. We didn't do it right away. She used disposable diapers on, we used disposable diapers on her for the first couple of months and then went into cloth tapering and it was great. And, and we used the same diapers for our second child. So yeah. Like to me that it was, that's, again, it was, we had a laundry in our unit. There was so many things so that were built into our like privilege that allowed us to be, to that, to be easier. Um, but again, I, I reached that low hanging fruit. Like I have a, a safety razor and I do sugaring for shaving. If you're the kind of person that removes body hair, I will never go back to a disposable razor. Hmm. That's just my personal thing. Some people will say, oh, that's the first thing I went back to. I, I gave up, I gave up on the, on the zero waste shaving. Um, you know, I use a shampoo bar on my hair instead of, you know, and again, it's just because it turns out that works for me. Um, so I'll probably never go back. Um, okay, there, I have a question. You know, oh yeah. Gallon, gallon bags. Gallon so bags. I yeah. find like random times I'll have the schools. This has happened multiple times because we tried to phase out Ziploc bags yep. was they'll say like, send in like a gallon bag with extra clothes or something mm-hmm. like that. What do you do in those situations? I use a wet bag. So but then, and you just have your kid keep it at school. Yeah. So we okay. have a lot of those. Like that's actually one of the things that if someone asks me, like, what 
what what should I get as like a new mom or whatever? I'm like, I my kids are seven and five and we're still using the same wet bags from when they were newborns. Mm-hmm. Um, now we mm-hmm. use them for clothes and for swim and for things like that. And also for on a road trip, you know, snacks, things like that. Um, most of the wet bags that we have are du- doubles, double, mm-hmm. whole, double bag. Yeah, I don't know. The have, wet dry. Through the wet dry. Yeah, I'm like double yeah. sided. And so, yeah, you can take your dirty clothes and put them in one side and still have the clean clothes. Um, we did have to write notes to their like daycares because they would send them with plastic bags home. We'd be like, there's a wet bag in there. Um, but once they did, it was fine. Um, gallon, like freezer bags. Like if you're using something for the freezer, we have some, there's a, we, I don't need to name the brand, but there's some that aren't the brand that everyone loves, but a different brand that, um, that I do like for freezer that are silicone that are bigger, um, that I find work well. But again, if, really on occasion, you just have to use a plastic bag and you just have to be okay okay with it. And again, the, my, my shift in thinking with that year where I was very strict was that there, there is a lot of just absolute disconnect to materials in this, in the world that we live in. So the idea of sending your kid to school with a little baby Ziploc every day and throwing it out every day to me, like, yeah, you do that if that's what you need to do. But if you buy a container, and I love stainless steel because, let's be real, we've all left things in the container for more than a week, especially over breaks <laughs> and things like that. We've all done it. Um, and stainless, like, you can clean it. You can clean anything gross yeah. out of it and nothing happens to it. Um, to me, like, I would never go back, you know, in that way. But again, it's like I didn't eat chips for, like, a year because it came in a plastic bag. And now I'm like... What's cool is that my children are very keyed in on re- on materials also, but no, again, no judgment. So when we go down the street and we see trash, we're not like, oh, what a jerk for doing that. We'll say, oh, we see trash on the ground. Let's pick it up if we have gloves or whatever. And the same goes for us. Oh, I, we got this these plastic forks. So we got this disposable cups at the restaurant. Instead of being like, oh, darn, we... We did this and how awful. We're like, let's bring them home. So we have a thing that's reused zone. It's called the reuse zone. And it's a lot of materials that would normally go get thrown away. But my kids and myself have identified them as valuable. And we've also identified them as ours. So they're ours now. They're our responsibility. And we either choose to throw it away, recycle it, we know dispose of it in some way, or we keep it and eventually throw it away. Um, But that, again, that to me is tied to minimalism because it's respect for materials, respect for things, instead of seeing that cycle of disposability. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. So you've been a big inspiration for me in buying used clothing because I used to be really, well, I used to avoid it. I've never been opposed to buying used clothes, but it always felt like such a hard thing Mm -hmm. for me. Because I don't like going to thrift stores. Like, I don't know. I don't like digging through all the stuff when there's like a thousand different choices because there's only one and it's in one size and may or may not be your size. And it's just going to thrift stores has never been fun for me. Is it fun for you? So growing up in rural Vermont and in Manhattan, there's one thing that those two places have in common, and that is no big box stores. (laughs) So I grew up going to small stores. So still to this day, a large scale thrift store is intimidating and exhausting to me. I definitely go there on occasion, but I prefer consignment. I prefer smaller, um, you know, more curated stores. And often the prices aren't that much larger. There's, you know, um, chains of thrift stores that are not, that are only clothing. So like uh, Once Upon a Child comes to mind. To me, I'm still quite intimidated by that scale. Um, it's it's overwhelming. But I have gone there and found good things. But to me, a smaller scale, even though there's less choice, oftentimes the quality, the um, you know, the the options are better. And so that's where I th- truly fell in love with secondhand shopping for myself was through consignment. So when I had my children, that was the first place I went. I have absolutely purchased them, um, you know, goods and clothing from larger scale thrift stores, but it's definitely not my first choice. The other thing is there's apps. 
there's apps where you can search like a brand, a size and a color. And then bam, it's right there for you. You know, you don't have to compromise what you want yeah, because you're buying secondhand. So if I went into a larger thrift store and I asked someone that worked there, can you help me find a size 6T white t-shirt? Would they help me? Or do you feel like they'd look at me and like, tell me I need to I go to I think they would say target? clothing is organized by size. Okay. Enjoy having a dig. <laughs> That's kind of what I suspected, but I was wondering if you ha- wondering if you had had the experience no. in some stores where they're willing or they kind of know the inventory. Um, I would say that is true for larger items. If you're looking for a bookcase or um, I had um, have had great experiences looking for specific, de- obviously I live in a 500 or um, 950 square foot house that is awkward. So it really feels like less. Um, I have very specific dimensions in mind. So I've had great luck in saying, I need a dresser that's no more than this wide and this tall and they'll find it for you. Mm-hmm. Um, clothing, No. I ask, it sounds silly to even ask that, but I also think there are lots and lots of people out there that do enjoy the hunt and that Absolutely. maybe, I mean, are there like, um, kind of like personal shoppers that will hunt through th- thrift, so shor- be, thrift stores? Is there an app for that? That's a, I would say that's a consignment store. So if you search, okay. um, you know, your city and kids consignment or your area or your County or whatever it is and kids consignment, I almost guarantee there's a kids consignment store or an adult, you know, whatever it is, if you want women's consignment, you know, that's what that is. It's curated by someone who has done the work for them, for you. Oftentimes people bring them goods to consign. So they're not necessarily going to the thrift store and bringing those items to their store, but sometimes they are. It's just like going to a curated uh, vintage store or antique store, as opposed to going to the flea market or an antique mall where there's vendors. Um, that is a dick. But if you go to a thrift store or sorry, an antique store or a vintage store that's curated, maybe you're paying a little bit more, but you're also not wading through the item. Someone else has done it for you. So to me, having someone look over an item, even just to say, is it stained beyond repair? Is it, is it torn? Is it, um, you know, is it, uh, for some other reason, really not functional or the style is just not what we know our clients want, then they'll say no to it, you know? So having someone else do the original work is excellent. So that's why I always go consignment first, just the the algorithm. I was looking for two very distinct things for my kids this spring. I wanted a bright colored nano puff Patagonia jacket for my son and some silver shoes from play P L A E a very specific style for my daughter. And neither of them I'm are sure even I made know. anymore. I'm sure I know both of those because oh, do you? <laughs> my daughters also like those play ones, those silver ones with the one strap. Um, called Emmy. Yes. I think you're right. We have, we have them in our garage right, or in our mudroom right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I found both of those things yeah online for a fraction of the price that were very gently used on Poshmark. Mm -hmm. And I thought about you the whole time because I was thinking, you know, it doesn't have to be that hard. It's just more of kind of a shifting of our habits. And it doesn't mean I have to go to the store even because I don't, it's not that I don't really like to go to thrift stores. I just don't really like to go to stores. Like I just don't have fun waiting around, waiting around Mm -hmm. shopping for things. It's just not really what I enjoy. So I want to be able to just kind of click and curate online easily. So like I can do this. I can find what I want. There are ways that minimalism and zero waste or going low waste is are at odds because there's, there's definitely like you have to keep everything or you can't throw anything away or whatever. And I definitely am not that I, I, I recycle jars that I don't need. Don't, you know, the zero waste community don't come at me. They already know I do. (laughs) Um, they also know I'm not a vegan, which is fine. It's how I live. Um, the, the act of being really thoughtful So in minimalism, you're not buying things thoughtlessly. You have an idea in mind. You're, okay, well, I need a pair of black pants or I need a pair of like a bright colored coat because you're being really intentional about what you bring into your home. And that means you've already done the work that needs to be done to secondhand shop well. I think people, people say this to me all the time, good friends of mine, you always have such good luck thrifting. And I'm like, well, first of all, I'm, I'm going. 
Second of all, I have a very specific idea in mind. And I, more often than not, will leave a store if I go there in person empty-handed. And to be completely honest, when I go to a big box store, if I need something like, because again, I'm not buying everything secondhand. You know, I'm 100%, as we've discussed with the zero waste experiment, is not a recipe for success. Um, And I will often leave empty-handed from a larger chain as well. Um, Sure, if you're going into your local Salvation Army Goodwill large store and you have no idea what you're looking for, you're browsing, you're you're probably going to come up empty and or you're going to come away with stuff you don't actually want or need. Yep. But if you are clear on what you want, I want a basket that's this size. I want this kind of thing. I'm looking for glassware that's this thing. I'm looking for a white shirt. I'm looking for denim. Um, <clears throat> you know, you often come away with what you need. And again, it's not luck. It's being focused on what you actually want. Yes. Well, I love that. And thank you so much for sharing your story today, Meredith. This has been really great. Yeah, I had so much fun chatting with you. Thanks for having me. Where can we find you online? I'm on Instagram at Meredith Tested, and I'm, I have a website that has been woefully ignored for many years, but it still has lots of great stuff, and it's MeredithTested.com. Great. I'll put the links to that in the show notes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you've enjoyed my chat with Meredith. If you want to get in touch with her, the link's in the profile at simplefamilies.com forward slash episode 308. I'd love to have you join us in the brand new Simple Families community. This week, we met for my first live office hours where I was answering all the questions from the community members. And probably my favorite part is watching you all learn from each other too. And this month in the community, we're going to be tackling the topic of what do you do after you lose it with your kids? It happens to all of us. So come and join us. The cost is affordable. It's $10 a month. You go to simplefamilies.com forward slash community. Thanks for tuning in. Leave a rating or review when you have a moment that helps this show to reach more people. Have a good one.